Okay, so this feels like it might be an interesting advanced topic to put out there. Again, blending some of the previous concepts. So I think there's one that I haven't introduced, or at least the way that I use it, which is the notion of um, Peirce's epistemological framework of firstness, secondness, and thirdness. Um, and then its relationship with an S-curve, which is a proposition that I think I'm the only one who's dared to try, um, which is to say that it's probably quite wrong. Uh, and then superimposing that on the Tainter curve, and superimposing that on the Arkady Smith model. Right, so it's a lot of stuff. Obviously, if you're not familiar with any of that, uh, this will probably be a bit challenging. And so you know, it is what it is. So let's begin at the beginning. Purse. The notion here, I think, is pretty simple to, to articulate because I think it lands pretty cleanly. Um, firstness, the metaphor of a, uh, a jigsaw puzzle. So there's a moment at which you have a jigsaw puzzle and you've tossed it onto the table and there's just sort of a pile of pieces scrambled about. This is firstness. You might think of it as almost a mystery. You've definitely entered into something. You know not what. And the beginning of the process is the beginning of literally becoming capable of knowing what it is that you're even dealing with. Right? It's the beginning of the mapping of the map. Um, and the process, of course, of the jigsaw puzzle is you begin to sort it in some fashion, you begin to have some sense of orientation. So you start flipping over pieces, the, making sure that everything is on the side that has the picture on it. You begin to notice, for example, those edges and uh, perhaps corners. And there's a certain point at which uh, enough structure has been discovered and that you move into secondness. Right? So you now move from firstness to secondness in the Persian model. And in secondness, you have, in some sense, a sense of the of the of the puzzle right uh, what is the picture of vaguely its color scheme or its basic geometry more importantly maybe its boundaries so you've got some corners and edges and now you're moving into the process of optimization you've kind of found the domain and now you're exploring the domain as a domain um you can go through and find the pieces and really get all the boundaries so you've actually got the rectangle we've got the rectangle of the puzzle locked in you're deep in fundamental secondness and so you go through it, you go through the process of exploring the territory. And if you notice, you go through this sort of very powerful meta process of actually learning how to explore the territory. You start doing things like sorting clusters of pieces together on the basis of some hierarchy of the structure. You know, is it a color scheme or objects that you know are supposed to be there? Obviously, you've got the basic strategy of learning how to build from the edges sideways towards the corners and out. And those kinds of meta heuristics that you use to begin to actually optimize your search of how to put the pieces in place so as to solve the puzzle. Then at some point, you reach thirdness. Now, thirdness is super interesting to me because thirdness is not the moment that you have completed the puzzle. Thirdness is that moment where you are for sure going to complete the puzzle. And thirdness is where the mystery has exited completely and you are simply in a riddle. Uh, you're in a puzzle, uh, which is to say that there's a definite end. And in some sense, you already feel where that end is. And you have a sense of what your, how much um, remains to be uncovered and how rapidly you are capable of uncovering it. And therefore, you have a felt sense, actually, of the duration of how much longer you're going to go, plus or minus something. And I think anybody who's done a puzzle knows that feeling. Like, yep, I got it. This thing is for sure done. I obviously have to go through the finishing touches, but it's done. Okay, now, the mapping. I would like to propose that there's a mapping. There's a mapping of firstness to the bottom of the S-curve, secondness to the point where the bottom transfers into the middle and then to the top, so the middle of the S-curve. And then thirdness is the top of the S-curve. The S-curve here is the, the understood sort of explore, exploit, senescence mode of complicated systems in general. Now, moving into the Tainter model, what's the relevant part here? Well, I'll do it through the lens of the Arkady Smith model. I think it's a little bit easier. Uh, and maybe also through the lens of, uh, of Baudrillard. So, as you begin to move into a particular territory, um, in the beginning of moving into the territory, in the period of firstness and early secondness, there is a, uh, a continuing sort of calculus on the part of distinct agents of what particular role in relationship with the larger whole is most advantageous to them. You know, a little bit like uh, a continuous ongoing prisoner's dilemma. And there's a couple of basic variables that they're looking at. One is 
the, the returns that they might get from different strategies, um, the risks that they might carry from different strategies. Um, so in the beginning, there is uh, a whole lot to be gained from collaboration. Right? We really don't know how to operate in this space. So everybody is very much in explore mode. Um, and there's not a whole lot of, of cookies to take from the cookie jar. Nothing has really been discovered and exploited and extracted. Um, and the space itself is, is actually, in some sense, still simple enough that there's a, a very high degree of ability to sort of monitor what's going on in the, in the environment in, in kind of the Baudrillard sense, we're at Baudrillard one. But as you move from firstness into secondness and then deeper and deeper into secondness, what this means is that you've actually begun to really map out the shape of the territory. You know, the, the high hills have been discovered. And the return on investment of additional search is beginning to get a little bit um, uh, less obviously uh, good. Right? So if I invest in exploring more territory, uh, maybe that's not my best choice. Maybe what I should do is instead of looking for gold, I should just start selling tools to people who are looking for gold. I should start figuring out how to set myself up on the hills that have been discovered and climbing those hills and protecting my position on those hills and less about exploring for new territory. Um, most specifically, I also beginning to look at trade-offs between the way that my actions are benefiting the whole, you know, growing the pie and taking a piece of it, and the degree to which the pie is not growing, and the real way to win is actually to get a bigger piece of an increasingly fixed pie. So this begins the niche of defection, right? the defection niche inside every human coordination structure. Uh, at what point do individuals begin to defect? Now, in the, in the middle, in the middle of secondness, in the middle of the S-curve, um, the returns on defection are still relatively small, right? The, the society has not yet become so wealthy that extraction is a boon. Um, the returns to collaboration are still relatively large. There's lots of, uh, of hills to be found. Think like the early internet. Um, and the technologies of policing defection, in the moment, oh, that wasn't a bump. I've been trying to get better audio, but this obviously gets in the way of my hands. Um, the the sub-niche of defection uh, is novel, meaning people aren't particularly good at it. They've now become sophisticated at, at the domain of defection itself. It's actually, it's going in through its own S-curve. Think about it. I've got a big domain, which is whatever domain I'm exploring, let's say oil or the energy industry or, or sort of post-war um, globalism. And then I've got a, a subsidiary domain that's always part of it, always associated with it, which is the subdomain of defection. And so in the beginning, the subdomain of defection isn't a particularly useful domain. It's high, relatively easy to police and relatively poor to exploit. Um, and so it sits there. As the domain of the master domain, the larger domain, becomes uh, more fully explored and its structure and you move through in deep secondness, suddenly the defection domain becomes a new territory and goes through its own subsidiary S-curve. Right? You have these superimposed S-curves on top of each other. So as we begin to get into the maturity phase, where we're past the middle point and now we're exiting into the into the last part of the of the straight element of the S curve, we're accelerating towards thirdness. Um, the defection niche becomes the new uh, new frontier. Right? Actually, learning how to defect effectively um, and be the one who actually claims the rewards of defection um, becomes an innovative niche. And of course, you begin um, entering into a, a bit of a competitive landscape between the technologies of policing and the technologies of defection. Um, but as the um, system begins to reach the edges of its expiration phase, you know, as the, the hills are almost entirely exhausted and now becomes very much a hill climbing exercise, more and more and more local agents are looking for places where they can get away with defection and are beginning to actually engineer the tools of defection um, and opening up that niche more broadly. Uh, in Archytas Smith, I believe this is called fractal defection. And so fractal defection is where more and more agents are engaging in a de facto collaboration with each other, where anything that creates dullness or blindness or slowness or stupidity in the policing structure benefits them. Right? It doesn't matter who's doing the uh, slowing the policing structure down, everybody who's engaging in some degree of defection is there. So as a class, there's sort of a, an implicit, mm, it's all kind of like, mm, play it on the slide. 
Um, and of course, that begins to create a, uh, a real drag on the innovative capacity, the generative capacity of the larger domain, the sort of collaboration side of the domain, which of course begins to reinforce, well, now I'm becoming a sucker if I don't defect, right? So now I'm moving to Baudrillard three and four, or our Heidi Smith moving from domestication into um, ferality. So what's the point of all this? Why am I bringing this up? Well, the point is, is it's important to know where you are, to think about what kinds of strategies make sense. You know, if you are in a new frontier, if you've entered into a new domain, um, then collaboration strategies are the best strategies, and so play that way. Um, if you are in a, an old domain, if you're at the last stages of a domain, particularly one where um, you know, it's deep in the Baudrillard 4 and where ferality is everywhere, then collaboration strategies are suicidal and you have to think about the th kinds of things to do. Um, now here's where I, the th thing that brought this to my mind actually, the reason why I thought it's quite useful to put out there. We are, I would say, uh, in a very interesting spot right now where there are different meta domains that are out there at the level of civilizations. Um, you know, China, for example, is not as senescent as the West for simple historical reasons, right? They are a little bit um, younger in terms of their playing out on this particular curve. Uh, Russia, for example, went through a pretty deep reboot and, um, and therefore updated and upgraded and moved to a different location on a different S-curve. Um, big chunks of the United States are in fact pretty deeply into the last stages of, of Baudrillard and fractal defection. <clears throat> so what do you do? Well, there's really one primary strategy other than to simply become feral, which isn't really a strategy, right? It's almost a pure reaction. If you're endeavoring to actually uh, figure out how to do something that is, uh, let's call it value or valuable or meaningful, uh, to hide in the blind spot of defection is in fact the strategy. You know, to begin the process of the new S-curve to become the, to enter into Percy and firstness, but in the blind spot or wearing the clothing of the senescence um, is historically at least, and, and I would propose now, the thing. I'll give you a concrete example. If you take a look at Bitcoin and crypto in general, um, a big part of the energy behind Bitcoin, both from its very beginning and even now, has to do with its utility um, to uh, steal money. Right, to, to, for in China, for example, to move your money outside of the control of the government um, in violation of their, their policies. And I, by the way, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying it's a defection behavior vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, and the same thing is going on in the West. Um, you might think, for example, the ability to repatriate uh, dark pools, for example. Like these are things that are being done that are being where crypto is serving a meaningful, useful purpose uh, for those who are using it in this fashion. Um, so these are standard defection behaviors. Uh, and therefore, it creates a, a power. There's a power base that's driving this, is, which is one of the reasons why it has um, you know, upwards of a trillion dollars of value now as a category, probably more. And therefore has some possibility of beginning to enter into its own um, capacity to protect its own integrity, its own sovereignty as a comprehensive system. Now, Obviously, I would propose that if you're watching what I'm talking about, you're not super interested in just being a, uh, you know, a, a feral actor in deep uh, Baudrillard 4. Um, but you can make use of that. You can make use of that blind spot. I would propose that being a, uh, uh, an, a Ned Stark is a useless uh, use of your life energy. Uh, but there is a way to do something where you can come in behind these blind spots, and in fact, in good faith and earnestly, begin to build out the new frontier, um, which, by the way, will tend to be um, difficult to truly understand uh, for those who have climbed the highest hills of the old frontier. You know, hill climbing, um, in fact, actually does select against valley crossing. And so if you can become the valley crosser, perhaps using the tools of defection, to allow you to have the room to maneuver to get there, um, then perhaps you can in fact cross that valley, which is the hard thing to do.